you know, it's interesting because, I mean, this, this wasn't essentially the topic that we were or, or that we are gearing towards, but we're sort of like, you know, maybe inching our way into it because I'm thinking now about um, about Iquitos and about ayahuasca tourism and sort of what the impact of ayahuasca tourism has been on Iquitos. Now, Iquitos itself, and I'm going to say what I know and I want you to correct me where I'm wrong, that the city itself is, it was its first sort of blossom was with the influx of money out of the rubber boom, if I if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the issues that are present there um, are present as a, as a long-standing history of colonial extractivism and especially um, with the rubber boom, and that ayahuasca tourism is showing up in what was already a mess. And so my thoughts here, and this, again, we'll, we'll get into the actual topic we were intending to talk about here. My thoughts here, are what, given the context of what we've been talking about so far, what do you think about the impact of ayahuasca tourism in this situation? Because on some hand, it's like, okay, it's not making things any better. And now everyone's uncle is a shaman. And I remember I got approached by a, like what looked like a 15 year old who told me they had ayahuasca. Uh, and I said, no, that's okay, man. I'm, I'm sorted. And so their immediate next thing was like, well, cocaine. <laughs> like, oh, no, I don't want that either. Um, but, but then on another end, there's an influx of industry that's providing um, economic, uh, like um, some, some sort of economic influx that can positively impact people like shamans who now their jobs or sorry curanderos now have an industry there and that there's there's jobs being made for people and this is a weird sort of idea you know like oh the western person comes in and saves the indigenous people from from the horrors of their of their life with jobs and and you know like positions at the retreat retreat centers or whatever else but what is your thoughts on the impact uh, ayahuasca tourism is having in the cultural atmosphere of Iquitos, essentially well i mean i think like everything it's ambiguous right this is the glass half full of half empty you know I, I i don't think none of the things out there in the world lend them lend themselves most often to very clear is this good or is this bad unfortunately there's 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 been there's been a there's been a if, if one takes a negative lens and we say okay how has this affected the traditions the local community blah blah blah, blah then you know of course you can find you can find things and then you can take a positive lens and you can say well how has this affected the economy that certain people you know is 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 traditional medicine now looked at it with more high regard uh, than before except and you also get Answers there, you know. I, I think I think the I think I think that the, the 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 trickiest part in this it's how to how to learn to establish sort of uh, uh, reciprocal relationships that are that are uh, that are um, that are that are e e equally beneficial, right? So you know when when um, because otherwise they will tend to be disbalanced. Um, you know the the, um, and I think and I think this is this is you know this is this happens in general uh, you know uh, in, in the in the in the relationships between people from the from the from the west from the global north and, and indigenous communities in South America it's very very difficult uh, to do this right, right and very very easy to do it wrong you know and for this what you need is sort of like better practices, better forms of wisdom. You know, I will give you an example from another field. I, I work in documentaries uh, for a number of years. I made a number of documentaries. Most of them revolve around indigenous knowledge. And on the last documentary, I was working uh, with some people from the BBC, uh, including, you know, Bruce, Bruce Parry had a long, long experience with this. And usually, you know, when you, with this, I mean, going filming in indigenous communities. So when you go filming in indigenous communities, it is it is a fact that certain people get jobs. You know, you need you need cooks, you need porters, you need you need you need, you need all sorts of help, and and these people people get paid. And it's also true that at the end you can't. It's the nature of filmmaking that you, you can't really film an entire community. You end up sort of focusing on one family on a couple of characters, and there's and there's a few people that get more camera time, more attention. They put more into the documentary than everybody else. The tendency would be to in our cultures. Would be to reward these people as well. Say, look, you've been you've been working more, but you've, you've put more time, more money, more effort, more this, more that. So you're you're, you're getting getting a special payment as well. Mm -hmm. What they found, and this comes from their experience of many many years, is that when you do this and you leave, you leave the community in a worse position than it was. 
because you've created an inequality that wasn't there before. And inequality in horizontal flat societies is very, very destructive because it generates, you know, it just, it just makes the social uh, harmony, it creates, so it creates this harmony where there wasn't. So the rule was that, of course, at the end of the shooting, there is a payment that is done uh, for all the time, effort, and help that these people, that you know, the community has given, but this is always takes the form of a community thing. So it's, it, it's not are, are we paying individuals, but what does the community need? Do they need, you know, some like you know medicines? Do they need a, 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 a help with a broken generator or an upper motor? Whatever the gift is, the gift is for the entire community, and this is always made clear. This is you know, and it is the entire community who asks, uh, in, in agrees what they would need. Um, this is the type of, I think, this is this type of, of wisdom, of knowledge around the best practices. Uh, I think I think it's what's really, really important here. You know, that's why, I, that's why I go back to that documentary, Green Hotels, and a few examples at the end of communities that have managed to do uh, tourism sustainable. The, la the last thing you want to do is you want to have a community that are just, you know, like it happens in some places, sort of waiting all day for the tourists to arrive. And when they arrive, they all, they all dress in the traditional gear, they do the dance. You know, and then and then they, and then they would they wait for the next uh, you know, for the for the next car. You know, there is a way because then the culture becomes a spectacle for the consumption of others. You know, again, there's also very deep, real, important material needs in many of these communities, and there is a lot of good that could can come from you know getting visits, getting attention, you know, getting you know the arrival of money. But how do you manage this in a wise way so that it's really mutually beneficial? Because the nature of extractive processes is that we get the best out of it. So if we, you know, and I've lived through this many times, you know, I've, uh, I've been enormously helped in my life, in my, you know, in, the, in every aspect that I can count by my, by the time that I've spent with indigenous people and the plants that I've taken with them, you know. But what did the indigenous people that gave me those plants got? You know, well, they got, they got, you know, very generously and fairly paid, you know, but, you know, but I get to, you know, make movies, be on podcasts, uh, you know, people, you know, give talks, people, you know, the, the, the benefits that I've gotten. And this is the nature of asymmetric relationships. So how do you make sure that you give back as much as you got, you know, or at least a proportional part? This is, this is really the, the, the work of a lifetime, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can't say. I'm sorry that I'm still I'm still at it, but 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 it, but you need to be aware of this, you know, as as you as you approach these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Especially too, it's like how do you give back in a way that that meets that that value exchange, you know? And, and if you think of it, I mean, in the Western world, it's very much like um, products and service for money. That's the exchange. Mm -hmm. And if you were to give back mm -hmm. to them, you know, like oh, I. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give them a percentage of all the income that I make from all this opportunity, and it just goes to the shaman. It creates the very problem that you were mentioning that these uh, that these documentaries were attempting to resolve. And then if you think about it from a cost for cost thing, it's like maybe you're making now, you know, quite a quite a bit more in your career, right? And that mm -hmm. the amount that you give back is. I don't know, you give a generator to the community or something, which mm -hmm. has as profound an impact, but it's it's maybe literally 3% of, of the benefit that you've made or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Does that count as balance? And, and in a Western context, it doesn't because you've now exploited those people financially and you've only given them back this small amount of what you've made. But if you were to meet it with the, like the sort of fiscal equivalent, then you would actually harm them in the long run. So it, it, it sounds like a very complicated... Um, and and difficult dance to to do, yeah. Yeah. Once I, once I heard somebody say that you know uh, you know that you know sort of material lack you know sort of poverty, it's it's a terrible thing and it's very destructive. But but uh, inequality in certain in certain uh, communities is even more destructive. So mm -hmm. when you have a situation where everybody is basically at the same level, you know there's all sorts of you know uh, problems and and and. But when one person in that community suddenly begins to rise above the others, then a whole new set of problems is being created. That's the reason why in these documentaries they, they avoided, of course, they paid people for their work, but they avoided, you know, focusing uh, the, the, uh, the interchange on just one person or just one family, even though they ended up maybe appearing the most or doing most of the participation of the work, because then you create an inequality. And then, and then that doesn't work. Now we deal with inequality in a much more, I don't know, I don't know if it's better or worse, but we sort of lift it. 
uh, but this is but this is not the case uh, in, in in many other places. Yeah.